the longer I served, the deeper my appreciation for a liberal arts education became because I, I found the utility of it. I found the interconnectedness of ideas and notions and concepts and principles. Uh, and it, it led to a, a fabulous 32 career, 32 year career uh, in, in our military before uh, choosing to retire. In fact, that type of educational opportunity was exactly what I wanted for my children. Uh, my wife and I are blessed with three kids and our, our oldest actually came here to the King's College and we watched the same type of educational approach unfold in her life and, uh, and are, are watching her as she's off now beyond her undergraduate, beyond her graduate program and, and into life beyond that. And so what I can, can say, not just from an official or organizational perspective, but from a, a deeply personal perspective, from a parental perspective, is that the conversation today is one that is absolutely necessary to go as far and as wide as we can have an audience, uh, as an audience we can reach. Uh, because fundamentally, if you wanna future-proof your education, a deep grounding in the liberal arts is the way to do so. A, a technical vocational approach is gonna be overcome too quickly, too seamlessly, and you'll be wondering how you were left behind and now suddenly scrambling to catch up. Whereas the deep grounding in a solid liberal arts approach is gonna prevent that for, for your life and for your effectiveness over the course of your life. And so I am I'm deeply appreciative to our moderator, Dr. Josh Kinlaw, for bringing together this fabulous group of panelists, absolutely uh, remarkable group of scholars and professionals. And I am very much looking forward to today's conversation and to where the, where the conversation will lead after today's event. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy Why the Liberal Arts. Josh, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, President Gibson. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I wanna thank our panelists uh, with the president for being here today. All three of them are entirely too busy this fall semester of 2020. Uh, so we thank you again, panelists, uh, for being here. I will introduce them uh, individually in a few moments. I'd just like to add a few very brief remarks myself before turning things over to them. I'll keep my remarks brief, but I wanna say a thing or two about our language, which President Gibson always referred, uh, already referred to, and today's scope. Um, as to the language, well, what are the liberal arts uh, can be a controversial question. And in fact, historically it has been. But I'll just say today is not the story of the canonical seven that will evolve as the trivium and the quadrivium. By liberal arts and liberal learning in the title of today's panel, I mean something simpler, broad learning in the arts and sciences, uh, liberal but also lifelong learning. I have the privilege of teaching at the King's College a course called the History of the Liberal Arts. I designed it after uh, leaving college and graduate school without ever taking such a course. It's been fun. <clears throat> Um, in the course, we spent a good amount of our time in the ancient world. And what you start to see if you study the earliest chapters of the history of the Western liberal arts is you'll see similarly capacious definitions of their terms like learning, liberal learning, educated. Take, for example, the ancient Greek ideal of paideia. Yes, it's learning, but it's much more than that. You can see parts of this in Plato's um, image of a synoptic view, how things, not just branches of learning, but how each branch fits with the other. If you move to the Romans, you, you can see similarly a, a broad concept in humanitas and then even in the artes liberales themselves. So many of you will have heard that quote from Terence, I'm a human, therefore nothing human is foreign to me. These are connected, I think historically. And then if you move finally to the process of 
Christianization and the spoils of the Egyptians from the church fathers um, to uh, later church history, you'll see uh, all three of these cultures agreed that education or liberal learning was more than data. It was about what could be called enculturation or socialization, or more simply, how to be a good citizen and how to be a good person. It was for most of these ancients unapologetically about moral formation. The fact that liberal learning is about more than data is inextricably tied to another characteristic and with this I'll close, and that is that the history of liberal arts begins and remains in controversy. We take this material personally. Learn, liberal learning forms a person and it leads and it raises that raises the stakes of the conversation and you start to quickly have to grapple with not only what should be taught, but to whom and to what end. Again, we take this personally and it can uh, lead to some angst. A quote, I'm not hopeful when I look at humanistic discourse outside the academy. Things are terrible both inside and outside and we need to fix both by returning to serious liberal arts education. Now that was written within the last two weeks by a professor I admire and a professor of faith. Um, my point here is that people like Socrates or Augustine probably would have agreed with sentiments like that or at least had similar conversations. Today, we're going to try to add something positive, however small, to what we realize is an ongoing, uh, never-ending and big conversation. As to scope, finally, of today's um, panel, uh, all four of us on the panel today have taught um, at large research universities, but we find ourselves currently, all four, affiliated with small colleges. And we want to pay special attention to the small college in particular, especially because it's there that these questions about what learning is and the tensions that liberal learning presents really come to the fore. They're practically unavoidable. But I'll just give one example and then turn to the panelists. One of these tensions, as you can see hinted at in the language describing today's panel, is, the, is between the useful or vocational ideal on the one hand and the quote useless or contemplative ideals on the other. With that said, I'll turn to the panelists. We'll start with a historian to set the stage for us. Dr. Joseph Lacanti will be speaking on the history of American college, vocational, liberal, or both. Dr. Lacanti is senior fellow in Christianity and culture at the King's College and also director of the Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation. His best-selling A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War is currently being developed as a documentary film series. This past July, he spoke before a U.S. House committee on our current national debate about public monuments. Our second speaker today is Dr. Jessica Hooten Wilson, speaking on teaching the classics. Dr. Wilson is the Louise Cowan Scholar in Residence at the University of Dallas. She writes widely on 20th and 21st century literature, and she's co-editor of the recent book, Solzhenitsyn and American Culture, The Russian Soul in the West, published by the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Zena Hitz will be our final speaker, talking about theory versus practice. Dr. Hitz is a tutor at St. John's College, Annapolis. Her recent book, Lost in Thought, The Hidden Pleasures of an Intellectual Life was published earlier this year by Princeton University. Panelists, thanks again for being here. We look forward to this discussion. I'll make one more note, as you may have seen on the screen audience, you may text in uh, questions for our panelists. That number is 646. 355-8946, but we'll begin with brief remarks for each of the panelists, and then we'll move to a section of questions and answers. Thanks again for being here. 
Dr. LeConte, if I can turn to you. Well, thank you, uh, Josh. It is great to be with you. It's great to be back at King's. And uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, you all, you're, all, you're as busy as we are. So thanks for joining the panel discussion. Let's just get into it. The Duke of Wellington, uh, the general who uh, finally defeated Napoleon in one of the great naval battles in British history, he understood the importance of uh, the academic institutions that trained men for the rigors of combat. The Battle of Waterloo, he said, was won on the playing fields of Eton and Cambridge. In other words, the patriotism and character required to defend constitutional government against dictatorship, it depended upon the right kind of education. In his book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, published in 1690, English philosopher John Locke, and for those guys who know me, you knew I was going to uh, drag John Locke into this. John Locke wrote that the welfare and prosperity of the nation depends upon the education of the young. One of the most consequential battles today, I think, is between a liberal arts education rooted in the classical Christian tradition and a radical, illiberal, and ultimately nihilistic outlook. Put another way, our campuses today are a battleground in the contest between ordered freedom and tyranny. These are the stakes uh, in this discussion. This is precisely how the educational leaders in colonial America understood their own situation, their own cultural moment. I think this fact needs much more attention as we consider the history uh, of a liberal arts education in America. Most of us are familiar, at least with the basic outlines of this history. So briefly, the college or collegium in the Latin for community is pretty much an English idea. It was brought to New England in the early 17th century by English Protestants, mostly Puritans, who left home in dissent from the established Anglican church. So not surprisingly, the first colleges had a distinctively religious mission right from the outset. They drew uh, upon classical and medieval approaches, but also replicated their experiences uh, in the colleges back, back at Oxford and Cambridge. Harvard College, established in 1636, founded by the Cong uh, Congregational Church as a theological school. The College of William and Mary, 1693, as an Episcopalian school to train clergy. Yale University in 1701, to educate ministers in our own way. And they meant in our own way. I think it was the founder of Yale who uh, accused uh, one of the Harvard uh, uh, educators of having less of the Holy Spirit than the chair I am leaning on. So things would get testy over that. Well, from the beginning of the 18th century until the outbreak of the revolution, there were only nine colleges in America. By the 1830s, there were about 50 colleges, but they were very small in size, of course fewer than 4,000 students in total out of a population of 13 million people in the United States. And yet, and here's the amazing thing to me, most Americans were not only literate in the sense that they could read and write, most of them were also literate in the principles of self-government. Most of them understood quite well the conceptual pillars of their democracy, the great achievements of the American founders. The Federalist Papers, after all, one of the greatest reflections on the nature of political society ever written, appeared in newspapers, friends, newspapers around the country. So in the 1830s, when Alexis de Tocqueville made his magical mystery tour of the United States there, what did he find? He discovered Americans of all classes who were well informed about the nature of their democracy. Just a few lines from Tocqueville. I do not know if all Americans have faith in their religion for who can read to the bottom of hearts, but I am sure that they, they believe it necessary to the maintenance of Republican institutions. This opinion, he says, does not belong only to one class of citizens or to one party, but to the entire nation. One finds it in all ranks. With just a handful of colleges in the new nation, how is this possible? In colonial America and well into the 19th century, most education, of course, was home-based, involving private tutors or schoolmasters, private academies. What all of these institutions shared was a deep appreciation for the classical Christian tradition. They offered a liberal arts education from a Latin word liberalis, meaning appropriate for free men. 
the disciplines of grammar, rhetoric, logic, they were essential uh, to participate in the civic life of the nation. So America's educators at all levels, they took these disciplines for granted and they drew upon the canon of the Western tradition in politics, literature, philosophy, and religion as they, be as they began to implement their civic vision. And religion or theology, of course, was the key, the discipline that informed all of the other disciplines. And the crucial text, of course, was the Bible. The Protestant character of colonial America made it almost inevitable that the Bible would play a pivotal role in the American Revolution, in the debates over the Constitution. It is not too much to say that the Bible was America's third founding document. In the political vision of the founding generation and among the educators who emerged, Republican government depended upon Republican virtue, which in turn depended upon revealed religion. If America's academic institutions were going to support and disseminate the Lockean ideas of equality, freedom, equal justice, government by consent, they must be grounded in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. And one of the most important examples of this educational vision was embodied in the figure of the Reverend John Witherspoon, the only minister to sign the Declaration of Independence. Witherspoon. This Scottish uh, Presbyterian minister took over as the president of the College of New Jersey, which became Princeton University in 1768. In other words, he becomes president at, uh, at uh, Princeton just as the country is entering an age of revolutionary politics, and he served in that capacity for the next 25 years. Listen to historian Ed Morgan. In 1740, America's leading intellectuals were clergymen who thought about theology. In 1790, he says, they were statesmen who thought about politics. Witherspoon thought about both. His mailing list included the, included the likes of James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams, Benjamin Rush, George Washington. While holding his post at Princeton, he shuttled back and forth to Philadelphia to serve as a member of the Continental Congress. He personally delivered assistance to General Washington and his troops in New Jersey. But his day job, friends, his day job was that of the college president. His immediate educational task was to restructure the uh, college uh, curriculum. So Witherspoon launched the most extensive program of oratorical study in revolutionary America. He designed mandatory courses in rhetoric and moral philosophy. He purchased state-of-the-art scientific equipment, greatly expanded the college's library. His grammar school became one of the best in the colonies. Now, as a minister, he said that his chief comfort was teaching the Christian gospel and training men for religious duties. And he performed these duties himself several times a week, preaching the word. But Witherspoon sensed that American society was on the brink of great cultural change and he adapted the educational mission of the college, its commitment to the liberal arts, to meet the challenges of his day. And so the campus became a center of revolutionary fervor and a refuge for freedom fighters. One British officer complained that the president of the college, Witherspoon, quote, poisons the minds of his young students and through them the continent, unquote. Another British officer complained that the college had become a seminary uh, of sedition. I love that phrase, a seminary of sedition. Well, as the political crisis deepened, there was mounting pressure for leaders who could write and speak for public debate. The cultural landscape in America is shifting. Witherspoon senses that America is in a crisis moment, and the liberal arts curricula of the college offer the intellectual, moral, and spiritual resources that were needed to speak into it. Here's a glimpse of Witherspoon's educational philosophy, just a few lines. In a public view, every good man, and we could add every good woman here, every good man and woman is called to live and act for the glory of God and the good of others. Here he has as extensive a scene of activity as he can possibly desire. He is not permitted to glory or to build an altar to his own vanity but he is both permitted and obliged to exert his talents, to improve his time, to employ his substance, and to hazard his life. 
in his maker's service or his country's cause, whatever be his station or profession, devoted to the public good under the immediate order of providence. Well, devoted to the public good. Witherspoon helped change the mission of the college from training ministers to preparing men for leadership in politics, education, and law. John Witherspoon served as president of the College of New Jersey from 1768 to 1794. Years of great trial, war, suffering, uncertainty, and cultural change. And through it all, this evangelical minister presided over the foremost school for statesmen in the new American Republic. Listen to a, a historian, G Gary Wills. He has called Witherspoon, quote, probably the most influential teacher in the entire history of American education. Wow. Overstatement? I don't think so. Among his graduates was one U.S. President, James Madison, graduated in 1771, went back to uh, Princeton to study theology under Witherspoon, by the way. Another graduate, Vice President Aaron Burr. All right, mixed reviews there on Burr. 12 members of the Continental Congress, five delegates to the Constitutional Convention, 49 U.S. representatives, 28 U.S. senators, and there's more. Three Supreme Court justices, eight U.S. Uh, district judges, one Secretary of State, three attorneys general, two foreign ministers. Another 26 of his graduates served as state judges, 17 as, mem as members of their state conventions that ratified the proposed constitution. Not bad. <laughs> Writing on the eve of independence, John Adams feared that we have not men fit for the times. Those men and those women would appear. They would be groomed for leadership at institutions a lot like the ones represented right here at the King's College and colleges like it around the country. In explaining the burden of responsibility upon our educators, John Locke describes students embarking upon their academic journey as, quote, travelers newly arrived in a strange country of which they know nothing. We should therefore make conscience not to mislead them. Travelers in a strange country. A liberal arts education rooted in the classical Christian tradition is a safe haven for these travelers, a bulwark against the false and degraded ideologies of our day, a pathway to grace and truth. To care about the academy is to care about our young people, which is another way of saying we care about the fate of our democratic republic. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is still a worthy calling. Let me turn it over now to Dr. Jessica Horton Wilson. Thanks, Joe. Um, if you had an altar call right now, I think I would come sign up for whatever <laughs> mission you are on. That was riveting. Uh, yeah, I want to talk, you know, as a Witherspoon fellow, I was as an undergrad, and then also I founded a classical school. So this is definitely um, a mission that I'm, I'm hopefully a part of. I want to talk a little bit about what it would mean then to teach these classics. What is teaching and why the classics? Uh, and in order to talk about that, I want to go back to Plato. Most people are familiar with Plato's cave. Those of us who are in the cave are living according to shadows. And the minute that you see the light and you know that they are not shadows, but you see the real, you wanna go back into the cave and you wanna bring people out with you. And that's what liberal arts is. Liberal arts is a freedom that once you are a free soul, you want to liberate others. You want to pass on this freedom that you yourself have received. So what does this look like? Plato said, or Socrates rather, that education would be to teach someone to love what is beautiful to teach someone to love what is beautiful. So I'm going to stick with truth, goodness, and beauty this morning as a way of structuring this idea of what it means to love what is beautiful. Starting with truth. Truth is kind of one of those um, abstracts that is under assault in our current situation. People believe that they each have their own truth or that there is no truth. Um, you know, you have the famous metaphor of the elephant and everyone's holding one part of it. 
I personally believe in Christian tradition. So the elephant's been revealed to me. And sometimes I might have the habit of too often just swinging on the tail and thinking that's the whole elephant. Um, but at the same time, I come back to what the vision of the whole is. C.S. Lewis says that reading great literature gives us all of the various perspectives so that we can see the tail, we can see the ears, we can see the trunk. Um, so it's not a matter that there is no truth or that everybody has their own part of truth, but that coming together, we move towards a more fuller understanding of what that truth is. We combine our various eyes, we combine these perspectives. Uh, the liberation that comes from the liberal arts is being able to see with this myriad of eyes right, but it is still I who sees, and that's from Experiment and Criticism, C.S. Lewis. So we're trying to combine the various perspectives, the various visions to be able to get at a truth. One of the things that we find in um, totalitarian cultures is they will try to control the narrative so that they themselves are the only place that you find truth. So for example, if you've ever heard Gary Saul Morrison speak about um, what happened in communist Russia, he says when he was over there, people said, we have the freest press in the world. Um, we are able to have the most free speech. You just can't print lies, right? And the joke was that of course, the, the communists controlled the truth narrative. So anything that you said that was against communism was in itself a lie. And Solzhenitsyn stands up and says, live not by lies. A true society uh, that is open to free discourse is going to allow various perspectives, even those that disagree. So a liberal arts education allows you to take in a polyphony of voices and not just one monologic perspective and be able to practice discernment with these voices to see who in fact is contributing to the truth, um, who knows the truth, how can we bring these voices together and discern what the truth is. Flannery O'Connor would also caution us um, not to only seek the truth that makes us feel good. <laughs> so truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it, she would say. So you have to be willing for the truth to make you uncomfortable. You have to be willing to seek out truths and be able to discern them even when they don't necessarily fit what you've become accustomed to. If you are living according to lies, then of course the truth is going to make you uncomfortable. And I think that the liberal society allows for that kind of free discourse to be able to seek the truth. The second part that I wanna talk about is goodness. The liberal arts are often decried as, you know, we can't make this argument that liberal arts make us good, right? We can't make this argument that those who study the great books are good people. Hitler was an artist. I mean, you hear this kind of stuff all the time, right? Um, at the same time, I think it's a both and. Piety is a beginning place. Like Joe said, the Bible is kind of the foundation um, for these great books that come after it. If you're people of the book, you're reading books in search of those narratives that help cultivate the things that you've learned and want to practice better. So liberal arts become a way of forming you in the way that you desire to go. So piety should be kind of the bedrock of that search in the liberal arts. At the same time, those of us who are sick and have never uh, known what is good. So think of St. Augustine, he would say, um, to a sick person, even the taste of sweet bread is going to taste bitter we have to practice tasting things that maybe seem bitter to us to learn what is good. We still have to uh, be able to cultivate our taste in the good, even if we don't necessarily have that bedrock of piety. So that's why I think it's a both and when it comes to goodness. Um, you not only want the resources that help to cultivate the kind of life that you seek, that you become a better person, but at the same time, you also wanna seek those things that you've heard are good and respond to them and start practicing a different kind of taste than maybe the ones that you've become accustomed to. I'm gonna use a, a contemporary reference here, but um, Martin Scorsese talked about the Marvel films a couple of years ago. And he said, the problem is, is that it's actually feeding you the lowest thing that you desire. And so that your taste never changes. And what you have to do is to taste something higher in order to start cultivating a better taste for yourself. Um, and I think that's what we have to do with the liberal arts is that we have to learn to practice a taste for something that is better. The last part on goodness that I'd like to talk about um, is the idea of having these things within you. And we all listen to music, you hear songs and you have things in your head. And if you're only consuming the culture that is around you, then you're gonna only have those kinds of songs playing in your head to use that analogy. Whereas if you are reading the classics, you have those things in your head, right? You don't just have like 
my lovely lady lumps or whatever is on the radio. Um, I probably just gave my age away, but you don't have whatever is on the radio. You instead have Shakespeare, right? The quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain of heaven upon a place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him, right? This is the kind of words and songs that you have within you um, that help you when you're facing crises, when you're facing isolation, when you're facing despair. These are the songs that bring out the virtues in you that you want to cultivate um, in your life, that you want to live accordingly. And so you need these better songs and these better words within. The last part that I want to mention is beauty. So we've truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, the liberal arts free us to desire what is beautiful, to love what is beautiful. As um, Josh mentioned, we want to cultivate these things in our life. Culture is going to try to get you to love what is ugly because it's, it's low and it's easy and it can be briefly satisfying. And for those who are in industries like consumer industries that depend on your money and the advertising, they're going to try to sell you what you're going to continue to buy and to continue to consume um, that is really easy to digest. Things that are beautiful often require more of you. They're more challenging. We think of poetry. Um, poetry does not come easily. And so we would rather turn on um, an easy Netflix than to read a poetry collection. But what just your gut and not just your brain. Um, they are bringing out the part of you that, that is your heart, that is your emotions, that is uh, cultivating a way that you know how to respond to the world better than the easy way to respond to the world. And I, of course, depend a lot on poetry for this, <laughs> personally. Um, I'm, I'm a poet and I love poetry, So this, but there's lots of different disciplines within liberal arts, like Josh mentioned. There's the, um, science does this for some people. You know, you read biographies of Einstein or um, mathematics, seeing the patterning in the world that requires more of you, but gives you um, a better understanding of beauty and a different language of the universe to understand and to listen to. Um, but we have to aspire to that, to find that song in the world and be able to listen to it. And I think the liberal arts, one of the reasons that they're questioned is unless you have actually experienced these things, it's hard to persuade people for what it is. It's hard to persuade people for what it is that they should desire. My, my colleagues have had bad English classes when they were in when they were in school. And so they imagine that what I'm doing in literature is dissecting it and teaching according to multiple choice quizzes and it's worthless. Um, but if they really experienced what it is that I hope I'm offering, I think they would learn to love it and long for it the way I do. So in that effort, I'm gonna close with just a small reading of T.S. Eliot's um, The End of the Four Quartets, and then I'll pass it to Zena. With the drawing of this love, and the voice of this calling. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of our exploring will be to arrive where we started and and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, from the last beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard half heard in the stillness between two waves of the sea, quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well, when the tongues of flames are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. That does not speak to your soul. <laughs> I don't know what will. Dina, on to you for the grand finale. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, you wonder about us old fashioned people who like old books and meeting in person. Uh, so I hope that, so I hope that um, internet difficulties will only strengthen your, uh, our credence, uh, our plausibility as spokesmen for old, old fashioned things. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a slightly different aspect of the liberal arts. 
uh, one that in a way is more practical and in another way is more uh, fundamental. So I'm going to praise the features of liberal learning and learning for its own sake that will matter, I think, uh, even if they do help to strengthen the American Republic, that they'll matter even after the American Republic has gone the way of Rome and the way of European Christendom and the way of Byzantium and the way of the Caliphate. Uh, and uh, also that will remain even, even when I think the true or the good or the beautiful uh, are opaque to us. Our hearts don't stop longing for them, but we sometimes can't find them in our experience. So what I wanna talk about is the, the uses of usefulness or why we should choose liberal learning over practical learning. So uh, liberal learning, liberal arts education and uh, study for its own sake, these are, these are matters of choice for us. They're matters of choice for you who are students or those who are choosing to go to a particular school or undertake a particular course of study. There are choices for parents who are supporting your children. There are choices for people who are seeking further study. There are choices for anyone who has any involvement in our educational system, which is all of us. Uh, since our educational system is supported by taxes, since it's supported by philanthropy, and since most of us at least have um, the splendid opportunity of having an education and of having choices about it. I'm not going to disparage useful learning I think useful learning is wonderful. I think it's profound. I think it's essential. I think it's fascinating, but I think you don't, you've probably heard quite a lot about it uh, elsewhere. I think if you try to figure out what the value of learning is, the chances of your coming off, coming across a praise of practical learning are gonna be very high. Whereas your chances of coming across a really compelling argument for liberal learning, for learning for its own sake, uh, for uh, useless learning, it's going to be a bit hard to find. So uh, I want to argue that you, if you have a choice between studying something practical or promoting a practical kind of education, I want to say something why you should choose instead the useless, the pointless, uh, the wheel spinning off in its own world. It sounds like something that you shouldn't choose, but it is, and I'm going to try to explain why. So think of the various things that you might want to learn and why. So say for instance, one wants to learn how to build things, roads, bridges, skyscrapers, houses, office buildings, um, networks um, for communication. Now, why do we build those things? What are we building them for? What's the vision which those buildings, those projects are going to serve? We're not just building things up and then tearing them down like sandcastles. At least I hope we're not. So we have some idea of what kind of life that building is supposed to support. Uh, and we need to think about what that type of life is. Whatever that type of life, whatever that way of being human that our buildings support, might change the way, for instance, we build our buildings. It might change the kinds of bridges that we build. It might change the kind of roads that we build. It might change the kind of skyscrapers that we build, depending on the vision of human life that's on the other end of it. Otherwise, as I say, we're at risk of building sandcastles for the sake of tearing them down or building crazy baubles that never function for us as human beings. Okay, so suppose that you want to learn in order to make your way in the world to earn a comfortable income for yourself and for your family, which is certainly a very reasonable thing to want. But what is it? Again, each individual has to ask themselves this and each person who's in involved with an educational project or, or who's supporting an educational endeavor, for what is that money? For what is the wealth? Again, what vision of human life is that wealth supporting? There's a lot of wonderful things that wealth can support. But we all know, I think, that uh, it can also become a kind of uh, something that's sought for its own sake. Uh, we all know about uh, misers in great literature, uh, the great miser in Middlemarch who keeps all of his money to himself and lives for the drama over who's going to inherit. 
or King Midas who had a dream uh, of turning everything to gold. Uh, what's the point of that? We know that it can have this enchanting effect. So we need to remind ourselves of what that money is for. So there should be two open questions for you at this point. What are we building for? And what are we making money for? But I can keep going. So we have a, a sense of wanting to move up in the world of having some power, having some standing, having some status. And that's especially true if we've grown up in circumstances that are diminished. If we've grown up in poverty, if we've grown up in uh, as a member of a marginalized group or in any way alienated or on the outside, we often want more than anything, respect, status, power of something like that. So wh why do we want that? Okay, what, how are we going to use that respect and that status and that power? What are we gonna use it for? What vision of human life is it going to support? Okay, let's think about some more down to earth examples. Health, okay, so people want to go to medical school, which is a wonderful thing to do, become doctors, cure diseases. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. Nothing could seem more important or relevant right now. But what happens when everyone's healthy? Try to imagine what that's like. So health is essential, just as building is essential, just as money is essential, just as respect is essential. But what's it for? What do you do when you're healthy? How do you live when you're healthy? Being healthy isn't enough. It's not a whole human life. It's just a condition for living a certain kind of a human life. Uh, so lastly, think about justice, which I think is the most splendid of all of the goods, all of the practical goods that you could uh, seek an education for. Even justice, splendid and beautiful as is, as much as it pulls on our hearts, you want to become a lawyer, you want to become a judge, you want to work in politics, you want to fight, be an activist, you want to fight for justice. Um, what does a just society look like? What do we do once we've achieved justice? Uh, what's justice for? It has a splendor in it, but it's not really for its own sake. It's for the sake of the rest of human life. So now I'm gonna to try to fill in in a sketchy way. And I think each individual, each group, each family, each uh, community should figure out for themselves just what you think that flourishing community looks like once you have the buildings, once you have the money, once you have the respect, once you have the health, once you have the justice, what do you do with yourself? What, what kind of vision of your life do you have? So uh, here's what I think we do. We do things that we would generally think were useless. We think and read and study and think. Uh, we love one another uh, in families or in communities. We make music or art or other forms of uh, celebration or festivity or praise. Uh, we enjoy the natural world. We look at it, we study it, we think about it, uh, we appreciate it. These are the works of leisure. These are the works that are human uh, and in which human life it culminates and is fulfilled. And uh, none of the other goods, not health, not money, not engineering, uh, not justice, none of those things matter if they are all, in other words, useless, unless there is some higher end some vision of a community, some way of being human, which they are supporting. So this is exactly what liberal arts um, teaches you to think about, to ponder, to search for, because I hope it's clear. I think it's an object of inquiry. It's an object of search. It's not going to be something that you look up on Google or even in an old encyclopedia you're not going to be able to find a vision of the the of human life and human community that suits you and your circumstances just perfectly. These things have to be worked out for oneself in one's own time and place with the people with whom one is committed to live. Uh, so we need to go on this search for what a good community looks like, what a happy human life looks like. One of the best ways to do that is liberal learning. Um, and uh, without that, as I say, other things you might study are useless. So 
one reason why I think that matters is that um, being a human being and doing human things doesn't require anything else to make it good. It's an end in and of itself. So if we can figure out what these things are, if we can develop ourselves as human beings, we're already developing the kind of community, the kind of vision that we need to which we can make subsidiary all of the rest of the things that we study. I'll conclude with a couple of examples and then I'll, I'll hand it back to you for questions uh, for us. Uh, one of the examples I love that I think illustrates this perfectly is uh, a woman named Irina uh, Ratushinskaya who died a couple of years ago. She was a Soviet dissident and a poet. And uh, when she was arrested and put imprisoned in Siberia for, uh, for dissent, for political reasons, she uh, passed on, wrote down poems she had memorized, the prisoners passed poems to one another. And she herself uh, wrote poems herself onto, with matchsticks onto bars of soap. And when she'd memorized them, she'd wash them away and write them on cigarette paper. Um, Romanian political prisoners did similar things. They taught each other languages with letters coded onto pieces of string. They tapped out poetry in Morse code through the walls of their cells. Now, uh, I hear a rumor, although I've never found a source. I say this in public so that someone can send one to me if they have it, that hostages uh, in the Lebanon hostage crisis in the 1980s we're told have done mathematics in their head in order while they were during their long imprisonment. Now, what was the use of these activities? What's the use of the poetry? What's the use of the learning languages? What's the use of the mathematics? It's to exercise their humanity. It's to reconnect with their basic worth as human beings. Uh, and in this way, um, intellectual life learning for its own sake isn't just uh, the sort of crowning of all achievements, that is what you get once you've done your engineering and your medicine and all of these wonderful things which make our lives possible. It's not just a crown. It's also a refuge when we lose everything else um, in failure, in imprisonment, in circumstances of terrible oppression, in decline, in despair of any kind. The liberal arts are there for us in a way that nothing else is. Uh, apart from art or music or worship or our love for one another. So with those words, uh, I'll, I'll hand it over um, back to Josh so that he can facilitate uh, the, our further conversation. Thank you. Thank you, um, all three of you. And we do have some questions. I'm going to invoke moderator privilege and ask one of my own first. And I'm going to... Um, start actually in reverse order with Sina, if I can go right back to you. Um, I'll, I'll say, again, I really appreciate your recent book. Um, I have a feeling you sort of sneakily introduce the reader to the fundamentals of Aristotle without sounding like a classical philosopher. So well done. Uh, that was impressive among several other things. But I want, <clears throat> I'm very interested on one of the last things you said was one of the questions I have about your book, and that is you use the word refuge. And for me, I wonder too, if that's some, somehow related to, you know, we've all, Joe quoted, uh, the classic quote is, these are the arts befitting a free person, originally a free man, um, education for freedom. But I wonder if you could, you seem to have a slightly different or maybe even significantly different idea of freedom. I think you'd agree with the liberal arts are for freeing persons, but could you just say something more about what you mean by that freedom? That's a great question, which I find honestly very daunting. And uh, <laughs> the first piece I wrote about learning had freedom in the title and I dropped it immediately afterwards because I realized if someone asked me what it was, I wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> but I, I do think that um, the primary sense and the way that my remarks today were suggesting, the primary sense of freedom is something inward, something that belongs to an individual, something which in principle really cannot be taken away from a human being. So it's, it's something that's deeply connected to one's dignity um, and one's worth and one's humanity. 
Uh, so I can say that much. I also think, even though it's not so much emphasized in the book or in my remarks today, that um, there's a type of freedom that liberal arts cultivated that is more practical, that does, uh, that's an appropriate type of education for a community of equals who are working out their destinies together. Um, and I also think that's very important. Um, I've emphasized the first just because I think it's a bit more general. That is, I, I want to think about why is this good no matter what happens, no matter what our circumstances are politically or otherwise, um, what can we say about why this is valuable? And my instinct is that it's, it's, it's still going to matter no matter what. So, so it's that kind of freedom, that kind of freedom which couldn't be taken away um, by your circumstances that's for me is, is at the bottom. Josh, can, Thank I, you. can I jump in real quick? Sure. So when Zena was talking, I was thinking about St. Jerome because you were talking about people in political prisons uh, who were, you know, refuge, you know, refuges. Um, St. Jerome said, when you think you're not being persecuted, that is exactly the time you're being most persecuted. And what he's talking about is that there's all these hidden things that are persecuting you uh, that you can't see. So when you don't have the suffering that feels like a crisis, when you don't have the, the political prison or um, the outside external circumstances, there are things that are happening that are trying to enslave you and control you. And uh, I tell this story about my two-year-old daughter when I was trying to teach her marketing <laughs> because we were walking through the grocery store and she was reaching out her hand for the frozen chicken nuggets, the ones who were like the frozen people, like Elsa shaped chicken nuggets. And so I tried to explain to her that on the outside of the package, it's looking wonderful. It's looking great. On the inside, it's not going to taste as good as it looks. It's tricking you. This um, stuck in her mind so that every time we went to a grocery store, she'd be like, they're tricking me. They're tricking me. Everything's tricking me. Um, and I, I think that right now, a lot of us are enslaved in ways that we can't see, that we don't actually have free souls, that we are being persecuted quite a bit. Um, by technology, by advertising, by even schools that are telling us that our only end is to be worker bees, right? To be ants in the anthill. And so I think the persecution is happening right now and that we have to practice the liberal arts to truly be free, to free ourselves and to free others into full human beings and not just consumers and objects. So I, I just want to thank Jessica for that. And I, I agree hundred percent. I think that is also part of that freedom that can belong to an individual is freedom from being dominated inwardly by certain kinds of motivations, desires for prestige, desire for money, desires for status, concerns about what other people think of you. And those are exactly the things which enslave the successful and the comfortable um, uh, rather than the more evidently oppressed. So I, I, mean, I think I write in my work about my, my life as a, as a um, Brief, brief life as a high prestige academic where um, I was addicted to prestige. I loved the success. It wasn't about learning. And that's a type of slavery. And it's enormously liberating now to be free of that and to be able to just say what I think and do what I like and study what, what, what matters to me. So anyway, I'll just thank Jessica for that and, and endorse it. Yeah, here, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think we've more or less answered that, but just to answer this question, but just to be clear, I shouldn't be surprised the last week of October on a college campus, a unifying theme of several of the texts is politics, current politics. Um, are the liberal, do the liberal arts belong to a certain culture, a certain faith or lack of faith? Um, but I think to put it maybe in a simpler uh, form for you, uh, can the liberal arts help us navigate um, the current, Jessica used the word polyphony. I would say it's more like a cacophony sometimes. Could, could anyone comment on maybe something a bit more specific about how the liberal arts have helped you navigate that? Uh, discern in Jessica's words, which voice is true? Uh, I'll leave that. Maybe Joe or Jessica, would, be, would you like to take a turn on that? Jessica, do you want to take a crack at it? I'm happy also to, to, to chime in. 
No, go ahead and start, Joe. And I'll sure. Uh, great questions and great discussion, guys. I just I just learned a lot here in the last uh, in the last hour with you guys. Um, you know, I know you guys have talked about this, I think, at the King's College, that amazing uh, sermon that C.S. Lewis gave in 1940, Learning in Wartime. And as an historian, I especially love it because I, I know the context. I know the immediate historical context pretty well. I've studied that period pretty well. And the survival of Great Britain and maybe Western civilization is at risk. They just don't know if it's all going to come to an end because it looks like the Nazis are really on a roll. And it's in that context that Lewis says, um, Perhaps above all else, we need intimate knowledge of the past. Intimate knowledge of the past. At this moment of political, cultural, global crisis, he says, yeah, the liberal arts, scholarship matters at this moment of crisis. And then he gives a reason. He says it helps to immunize us from the great cataract of nonsense that pours forth from the press and the microphone of our age. That's 1940, the great cataract of nonsense. Well, guess what? It's ramped up the cataract a bit. It's gotten even more poisonous and invasive. So uh, for myself, having historical perspective on the current moment, on our current crises, whether it's a pandemic or whatever it is, that helps me a lot uh, as I kind of think about this moment, realizing, all right, uh, we have been through worse as a society, as a civilization. It is no guarantee we're gonna come out stronger having that perspective, but it means we have some of the resources that we need to meet it and at least to be faithful in the moment, because that's just one of the great examples of uh, uh, great benefits of, of being a historian is you see the examples of men and women who when the crisis came, they stood their ground and they testified to the truth, whatever the consequences. And that's a great encouragement to me just as a human being. <laughs> so. Yeah, sometimes I wonder if, um my vocation in life is just to plug Alan Jacobs, but uh, if I can recommend a couple of his books that I think do the same kind of thing of getting us out of this cataract, The Year of Our Lord, 1943, in which he does talk about this learning in wartime essay, but he looks at the fact that a lot of intellectuals and writers were doing this in the middle of the war. Yeah. Simone Weil is writing on Homer. Um, Auden is writing on vocation and society. Jacques Maritain, um, who, I can't remember who else he mentions, but T.S. Eliot, Lewis. So he's looking at all of these figures and what are they doing? They're looking at education. In, in the middle of <laughs> this fascist yeah. war, uh, they're looking at education and, and trying to figure out how education kind of frees us um, in, in the middle of this, this moment. So I think that's important. I, I've also, I'm gonna echo what I've heard Zena say and then let her maybe say it and expand upon it. But I've heard Zena talk about when people say that this narrative only belongs to someone, that liberal arts is kind of this um, elite white male um, worldview and that that's, that's who owns the liberal arts. She's saying, well, who's, who's saying that, that narrative? And uh, really what happens is then you only allow, if you think that all the great books are just for white men, then you're just keeping minorities as oppressed as they were in the 19th century by not opening the doors and being hospitable to the conversation that has been going on for millennia, right? Um, and so I, Anika Prather talks about this quite a bit. Um, Angel Adams Parham talks about this quite a bit and that it's not just one group or one political ideology or one demographic uh, to who this conversation belongs. This conversation belongs to everyone. Um, but I'll let Zena maybe change whatever I said wrong and add to it. I, I feel like I've had enough airtime. I'll just say briefly that um, there's a, a tr liberal arts tradition, which I, I um, very strongly connect to, which I, I try to carry on in, as best I can, which is one where uh, groups to which these books are not given, who do not inherit these books from their rich fathers, um, but working people in, uh, in Britain or in the US, uh, Black American people, enslaved people, uh, Native Americans, people from every walk of life all over the world have picked up the old books and made something from them that was theirs. So uh, one of the things I've been looking at, Anika Prather, my friend, was, has been my mentor in this, but you start looking at the, the great Black American authors Douglas, Du Bois, uh, Baldwin, uh, Richard Wright, Maya Angelou, Huey Newton, all these people, Malcolm X, King, all of them are educated in the classics. 
Um, and they are free people. Uh, they are their own. They are not, they are not, they're very different from one another. Uh, and they're certainly different from uh, the world in which they um, came up. So I, 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 it's that, that, that history that I keep in mind and, uh, and remember that these books are for everyone and they're, they're resources which uh, can renew us, whoever we are and whatever our circumstances are. Thanks for that. Um, I'm looking, we have time for perhaps um, maybe two more questions here. Jessica, you're getting a lot of questions. Um, could you say something, Jessica, about your experience in uh, the classical school you mentioned? And also just for the sake of, um, again, our, our, our terms, our vocabulary, do you or other panelists feel the need to make a distinction between classics, classical, and liberal or liberal arts? We've got a couple of questions on our terminology as well. Uh, so for me, classical education has to do with the classics, yes, but also with the classics as in the ancients. And so our education beginning with uh, the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans. Um, it's so funny when we loop those together and they're like a thousand years apart, but, but really we're talking about uh, for hundreds of years, that really was people's education. And I've tried to talk to my teachers, you know, there's only so much you can do in a classroom day. And so I begin with this idea of piety. The very first thing is if at the end of every day, our children love the Lord more, great. The next thing is um, if they actually love learning. And then the third one for me would be the classics, the Bible, um, and math, mostly meaning math in the sense of um, detecting these kind of patterns, like I talked about, math in its uselessness. Math in, um, we're measuring time, we're measuring space, we're, you know, listening to the music of the spheres kind of idea of math. And so um, for me, classical education is, are those three things um, as we find them in Socrates, as we find them in Homer, uh, as, we, as we see them when we're learning Latin and when we are practicing Greek. Uh, so that's what I did with the, with the classical education. We're only up into sixth grade right now. And so it's definitely burgeoning and it, it's growing and changing. Uh, and the liberal arts is the more of the content or the rubric, that quadrivian trivium is the kind of the skeleton that allows us to flesh out what classical education looks like in practice. Thank you. Um, and Joe, if I could ask you one more from the audience. Um, you mentioned at some point um, Adams or Witherspoon looking across the American landscape and seeing a shortage of educated persons. How does that square with, or, or the one way to ask this is, does that comfort you or does it discourage, worry you uh, from where you sit at practically 2021 with regards to our nation's learning? Uh, could you say anything about that? <laughs> does it discourage me? or give me hope. I guess I'm feeling both emotions at the same time to be a little, uh, to be a little churlish about it, I guess. I think we gotta be realistic about uh, kind of where we are, uh, you know, uh, in our society, in our culture, in the academy and what's happening. And so um, the, the evacuation of the Western civilization curriculum from so many of our schools, that evacuation, I think we're, we're paying the dividend, we're paying, the, we're reaping the, the, uh, the whirlwind of that right now in so many ways. I think in our national life, our political life, our cultural life. So uh, there, there's just trouble in River City. There's trouble in River City, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I guess what's encouraging is, if you think about the, the, um, the capacity though for these little beachheads, the small liberal arts colleges, these beachheads of sanity and grace and beauty and truth, we can't know what the ripple effects are gonna be a generation or two down the road. And this is a generational, multi-generational project of trying to renew the culture. It's not gonna happen with any election cycle. That's for bloody well sure, right? So uh, what was going on at Oxford with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and the Inklings, I've got to bring it back to that for a moment. They never could have imagined the impact they were going to have. This group of men, seven, eight, nine guys, 
uh, meeting every Tuesday and every Thursday nights for the, you know, for over 20 years. They had no idea the impact they were going to have culturally, but it's with us to this day. So I'm sober about the challenge, but I'm also hopeful about what men and women of, of good Christian character, excellence uh, can accomplish by the grace of God. Thanks for that. So, Josh, can I add uh, go ahead, Jessica. Yeah, I've heard Joe say elsewhere, don't be afraid of the small gradual changes. So just keeping that in mind for everybody who's listening, you know, you make a huge triumph if you just turn on net, turn off Netflix for like one minute and read a poem. Like <laughs> a big triumph. If you're doing. So just aim small. And, Baby steps. And, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for that. I think that's a good place for us to wrap up here a few minutes early. Um, thanks, audience, for your questions. Um, and again, to each of our panelists, again, I really appreciate your time. Uh, you did not have time for this, but you made time. So thanks so much for prioritizing this important conversation. As I mentioned in the beginning, we know this is a timely topic, but it's also a perennial discussion. It's going to keep going. Um, the King's College will post this recording online, um, and I would also add that resources like this conversation are being collected at a website called theliberatingarts.org, which is uh, where at least Jessica and Zena, among others, are involved or affiliated with, but that's a good spot to find tools and also uh, study in college programs where you can find uh, more conversations like these. That's deliberatingarts.org. I thank you on behalf of the King's College, thank our panelists again, and thanks for attending.